of the Department of Government. I'm also the Assistant Director of the Wasson Center for Public Policy. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today talking about health policy. We really are standing here on the cusp of a dramatic possible change uh, to the current system as it is. So um, I think it's a really important conversation to have. So um, today I'm gonna talk about um, a part of the story actually that I think is always left out of the conversation about what we should do with the ACA, and that is why we enacted the ACA, okay? Um, it was not like the American health system was just rolling along and everything was great, and then all of a sudden we're like, hey, you know what we should do? We should pass this Patient um, Affordable Care Act, aka Obamacare, and really mess everything up, okay? So we'll talk about the status of the system coming in, and then we're gonna talk about what the ACA did and how it did it. Okay, a lot of people don't understand all the complexities of the law. I think most of the attention is focused on the ACA as a healthcare exchange, and that is obviously the, the major component of the law. But there's a lot of things that, um, that were enacted under the policy that affects every American's health plan. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the effects, right? So we pass this key landmark legislation, we do a slow rollout with it, it really doesn't go in effect until 2014. Now we're in 2017 and we're finally starting to get a sense of the effect that it has on um, the system. All right, so when we're talking about American healthcare, really healthcare anywhere, we're really talking about these three areas. Access, quality, and cost, okay? And when we were coming into the ACA, we had problems in all three of these areas. So let's take a look at access. This is an insurance trend graphic um, looking at access, right, from 1999 to 2010. And you can see that most Americans are receiving their insurance through an employer-sponsored plan. It's a really interesting system. Um, you know, you could argue puts a lot of burden and onus on employers to provide health insurance. It's kind of unique, right, compared to our other democracies that are using these single-payer government-run options. Um, and we can see the uninsured rate was at 13% uh, in 1999, and it was ticking upward in 2010 when the law was passed. So that means and translates to about 48, 50 million people in 2010 who didn't have insurance. All right, so when we look at the US and we look at the second category of our healthcare spending, we're looking at cost, okay? And what we know for sure is before the ACA and after the ACA, we still have a cost problem. So when we're looking at the other countries, you can see the United States is here. Right, and if, as a data scientist, I'll tell you that's what we call an outlier. Right? <laughs> right? That's an outlier. I mean, we are way, way, way out on what we're spending GDP-wise as percent of GDP on healthcare in this country. And um, you know, put that into another perspective. When we look at what we spend on healthcare versus all those other social welfare programs, we can see we're out of balance with our friends and neighbors. They are, you know, even though the government is the provider of care in these countries, we are providing more to healthcare than we are to these other social services. Um, and then one more graphic on cost, we're looking at this spending rate over time, and why I want you to see that is that we can see we had a cost increase problem going on early and all the way late. We haven't seen a fix to that problem, so it's not like all of a sudden the ACA passed and insurance became expensive. Uh, it was one of the problems that was meant to address, and we'll talk about how well it did that uh, in a second. So here's a graphic talking about premium <coughs> contributions for families, basically, as a percent of their median income, which in the U.S. is about $52,000. I think it recently ticked up a little bit to $54,000. Um, and you can see that as a chunk of my income, that health care cost has been rising and rising and rising. And income, by the way, during that same time period has been relatively flat. All right, um, and then our third category um, that we can evaluate our health systems based on is outcomes, right? Okay, so we're spending a ton of money. Surely we're gonna have the best outcomes in the world. And what we find out is the United States is down here at the bottom, okay? We have terrible outcomes. When we compare them to other countries, uh, our life expectancy, this is like four or five years shorter than the countries at the top of the ladder. Our infant mortality, that's the number of babies that die in the process of being brought into the world or those first few months out of the womb. I mean, look how high that is. It's double almost some of those other countries. Um, we have, you know, it's not 
uh, <laughs> myself included, a problem with obesity, right? We look at obesity rates in the US, huge numbers, I mean, it's the highest on there. And then, um, you know, it's not like we have more old people than everybody else. We do have a lot of old people, and we love them. And for example, <laughs> mine is making me eclairs tonight, right? <laughs> but um, all of our technology in healthcare has learned, has kept all these older people alive for longer. And now when you retire at 65, you have a whole new life, right? You're living a whole, like, 30 years after that. So, um, all right, so here we go on outcomes we look at the u.s you got this ranking system you can see the uk is totally kicking butt right i mean they're number one in so many areas the u.s is number one where oh God, that's what you're supposed to say nowhere right <laughs> we're not number one anywhere except for spending right which is not where we want to be we don't want to be number one in that category so what did the aca do Everyone knows, it eliminated something called the pre-existing condition ban. Now, you young millennials have no idea, but for us older folks, when we had to buy private insurance or even employer insurance, there used to be these giant health history forms that expected you to recount every cold you ever had, which you imagine is very difficult to do. Uh, so now when you go and buy insurance, and I happen to know this you know, from buying insurance in the private market before I came here, you just, fill out a form, there's nothing about your health at all. You could have cancer, you could have three heart attacks, 10 stents, doesn't matter, right? They're not gonna ask you about it in that application. Um, it eliminated the lifetime ban on care. So if you came out, you know, you know, six weeks or 10 weeks before viability really, or, or like uh, not needing uh, heavy care in the NCU, um, and you, uh, you spent million, maybe $2 million to just get out of the hospital upon birth, Right? It used to be that other insurance companies say, hey, you know what, you hit your lifetime cap. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, right? But it's true, this is a real problem. So they extended and eliminated those lifetime caps. It mandated full coverage for preventative services. One of the arguments being, the reason we have such terrible outcomes is that people wait and wait and wait for care because it's expensive, because so many people were locked out of the system. So let's make sure that if we're gonna cover everybody, we also encourage them to use the services uh, and catch things early, like diabetes, if you can catch it in the pre-stage versus treating it after the fact. Um, mandating full coverage of contraceptives, which ultimately would become the first battleground other than the state exchanges of the law. Right? This, uh, of course, we get the Hobby Lobby case dealt with that idea. Um, we equalize premiums between men and women. Women are more expensive to treat, and so insurance companies call, charge women more than men. Required plans to cover mental health services. Many plans do not cover any access to mental health services. Uh, required clinical trial coverage, which of course is really key in cancer treatment. Um, and then it also required reviews if premium increases were greater than 10%. So if the insurance company decided to hike the premium up that much, they had to justify that cost adjustment. Required rebates if administrative cost exceeded care amounts required that all young people, and this is maybe one that you're more familiar with, could stay on their plans until age 26, regardless of college status. Used to be just, if you were in college, they had to keep you, could be, I mean, being that you're still dependent. Um, and then establish federal and state health exchanges. The idea being that in 50 states, 50 state exchanges, cooperative states, bringing in these people who have just a little bit too much money to qualify under the old Medicaid formula, bring them in and give them heavily subsidized insurance. And that makes up for um, the idea that all individuals were required to buy insurance. So you were required to buy insurance, but if your income was in one of those categories that isn't poor but isn't wealthy, we would subsidize, the taxpayer would subsidize the cost of that premium for you. Okay. And then, of course, the very contentious idea that employers should provide health insurance. I think the threshold for that was 25 employees. So that's what it did. And when we look at the effects, I mean, obviously, in our three-tiered system, access, cost, and outcomes, of access is the one that the ACA truly did have a really remarkable impact on. And I can show you how remarkable that impact is through this graphic, which goes through um, a period of years leading up to the ACA and afterwards, and Internet Explorer always chokes on this uh, process the first time, so just give it a second. Oh. 
You open Chrome. I know, I need to do that. That computer doesn't like Internet Explorer. It's usually the second time it works without a char with a char over it. I don't know why. All right, here we go. So watch this graphic, if you will. This is 2011, 2012, 2013. ACA kicks in on access, and boom. I mean, that's a dramatic reduction in access. So that's the one area that the ACA has performed quite well in, hasn't performed as well as it, as it would have had all states participated in that uh, Medicaid expansion. Of course, Virginia is not one of those states, and the states had many justifications for why they didn't participate. But that left a gap in coverage for a lot of people. Uh, so if you were in Oregon, I mean, Oregon's insurance rate, would, that uninsured rate would almost, it's insignificant actually. Uh, but in Virginia, we still have a pretty good chunk of uninsured people because of that lack of that uh, Medicaid expansion. All right, one thing it didn't do much to help us on, cost. Cost was rising before the ACA. Cost is rising after the ACA. Uh, but there are arguments and a lot of technical uh, mumbo jumbo as to whether that rise has decreased a little bit, right? And there's some evidence to support the idea that yes, they're rising, but they're rising less than they were rising before the ACA. But you can see that ladder is still growing, right? And then, um, you know, the costs are not uniform. So the big news that really hurt the Clinton campaign this summer was the Obamacare premiums were gonna go up. Uh, and in some places, these places marked in red, they were going up astronomically, 30% increases in a premium. And that's a, that's a huge chunk of change that voters were facing. Um, you can see how that might have had an effect in the Midwest, which was hit, hit pretty hard by that. Uh, well, you know, so not every place had that. In fact, some places saw their premiums decrease. It wasn't a uniform effect. <laughs> All right, so um, since we're running out of time, let's look at these um, replacement proposals that have been put forward. We just a few days ago got the Cassidy Collins plan. This is an ambitious plan insofar as it basically says, hey, let's make it an opt-in. If you're in California and Oregon and you love Obamacare, you can keep Obamacare going. If you're not in a state that likes Obamacare, your state can choose to <coughs> abolish Ob Obamacare, okay, which is kind of the, you know, don't make anybody mad plan, I, I guess I would call it. <laughs> um, so here's the problem with that though, is ultimately one of the things that struggles under the ACA is it, is it to pay for all the old sick people for all the people who have had cancer, for all the children that have you know, lifetime conditions, the only way to do that economically viable for the insurance companies who are in it to make money, right? I mean, that's the point of a business is to make money, is to push all the healthy young people in, right? So anything that pulls healthy young people out of the system and puts sicker older people into the system, that's gonna put it in a death spiral. All right, um, and then of course this idea that we would just create these smaller, increased competition among uh, states. And, you know, some states have one insurance company to operate in the state. Obviously, a monopoly is never good for price, right? Uh, reauthorized catastrophic plans. So Obama famously roasted for if you like your plan, you can keep it. What he left out was if you have one of these catastrophic health plans that cost $15 a month but have a $15,000 deductible, that plan is not gonna meet the standards anymore, the minimum standards, and those plans are gonna dis disappear. So the GOP says, let's bring those catastrophic plans back. And for the, all of the sicker, older people, we'll create a separate high-risk pool, right? And then subsidize insurance that way. So the taxpayer would subsidize access. Um, and then um, recently, recently, just recently uh, as in yesterday, uh, there was a leaked audio from a Republican retreat talking about the political consequences of the ACA repeal, which was always gonna be difficult to repeal. A little bit easier in 2012 had Romney been victorious because most of it had not been implemented, but really complicated now in 2016. And uh, the audio reveals that they understand that outside of the talking points and the politics of it, they're acutely aware that this is gonna be difficult. And one of the ways it's difficult, you know, one of the plans to pay for these high-risk pools would be to eliminate the exemption that health insurance premiums currently enjoy uh, when they're employee sponsored. So for the average middle class family, that means your taxable income will increase twelve, fifteen thousand dollars right? 
So obviously that's a big tax increase on the middle class. I would call that DOA, dead on arrival, right? So this is gonna be one of the most co um, hotly contested issues coming forward. Trump has a divergent interest. For him to sign anything that repeals without a broad and um, you know, access-driven replacement plan, he, he will be taking health insurance away from about 20 million people and quickly the American middle class will also see a lot of their benefits reduced, right? So politically, very difficult to imagine him striking that pen to a piece of legislation that would create so much headaches for him as people tend to look at the president, as we know, right, as their source of angst when things don't go the way they want them to go, so. All right, so I'm looking forward to questions both on um, our economic topics and on the healthcare topic. I don't know where you wanna, you wanna sit.